Well, good morning, everybody. Good morning. Test, test, test. Good morning, everybody. Welcome out to the Grace Gospel Church. Hopefully everybody had a great Thanksgiving. It was a great Thanksgiving for us. Got to spend it with the fam. Nice, had some good food. And that was just a great time, actually. Just really enjoy hanging out with the fam. And, and uh, coming here, it was a nice long weekend, so appreciate that. What's up, Sam? And, uh, but uh, if you want to need the prayer list, uh, obviously we want to pray for people daily. And uh, we do have an offering in the back. It's a between you and the Lord. You know, we, do our, we are tax exempt. So if you want to put your hard earned money in the box, it's between you and the Lord. And the money does go for furtherance of the gospel of Christ. That's what the money is used for here. Not, uh, you know, not for any individual or anything like that. A couple of announcements coming up here. We have a prayer meeting this Wednesday, 6.30 to 7, and then 7 o'clock we have Bible study. If you want to come out, we welcome and we invite anybody to come out. If you've got a perfect time to come and ask questions, have fellowship, we definitely enjoy that time together. Also, a Christmas service will be that Friday night. Last year we had a Friday night service, kind of, kind of a candlelight service. We filled the, the house. It was great. So elders and myself and my wife, we wanted like to do another Friday night service at 6 o'clock. So we would like to, you know, sing more songs than usual. Someone sings four or five songs at the beginning, and four sing four or five songs at the end, and uh, so the piano players could work that out. So if they, you know, I don't, it's just not one piano player needs to play. If we have multiple musicians here, so love for people to come out. I think Brian and Carrie are going to join us that evening. I think Brian's, Carrie, we're going to want to do a couple songs. So, but it, uh, what a great night that is. We'll have some snacks and hors d'oeuvres, you know, before and after. And uh, so Friday night, the 22nd, at 6 o'clock. Also, uh, Alex and Miracle's baby will be due in May, May, May 11th. And then Dr. Yankee and Betty will be here May 19th. So we look for them coming already for next year. I can't believe it's going to be December this week. Man, the Lord has blessed us with an incredible fall. Loved it. Also, uh, seven points of truth here. This you know, we'll quickly review that. that you know, the fact is that we're all sinners. And um, we've all missed that mark of perfection. We ultimately, we're born in sin. Matter of fact, my wife was having a conversation with her granddaughter just a couple days ago, Paxson, about sin. You know, when you make poor choices and uh, when you do bad things, it's sin. And ultimately, all Satan, you know, brought sin in. They were reading a book to her. And then she looks up to Mimi, that's what she calls her, and she goes, well, can I, can I sin just a little bit? <laughs> yeah. I think that's uh, within all of us, right? That's that flesh nature. And that's that, uh, you know, we're born sinners. Can I sin just a little bit? And, uh, you know, we think we can get away with it. And we can't. Because ultimately, with sin requires a death payment. So many religions and churches today think you can wash that sin away or you can go to a confessional booth and some man will absolve you from sin or you can ultimately just walk to the front and, you know, dedicate your life to the Lord and, or you, maybe you can just turn from it or you can pick up your cross. We know those are false teachings. Because we've sinned, it requires a death payment. It requires a death payment. And we actually actually deserve to go to hell and pay for our sins for all eternity. Wages of sin is death. We deserve to die a physical death and we deserve to die a spiritual death. We know that uh, you've got to be perfect to get to heaven. Revelation 21, 27 says, And there shall in no wise enter in anything that defileth, neither whatsoever worketh abomination, or maketh a lie, but they, that are writ but they, that, they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. So your name's got to be written in the Lamb's book of life. And you got to be perfect. Not even a lie will enter into heaven. A lie requires a death payment for sin. You cannot earn salvation. No, you can't. For by grace are you saved through faith. Not of yourself. It's a gift of God. Not of works that any man should boast. 
around the world today, religions, people thinking they can earn their salvation, they'd be good enough to go to heaven. But we know that to get to heaven is simply a free gift. It's by grace. None of us can ultimately earn it. None of us deserve it. Christ died for our sins. Christ died, that's history, Christ died for our sins. For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. We need Christ's righteousness put to our account. He paid for our sin, and ultimately when we believe, we receive his righteousness. He gives us the perfection we need to get to heaven. And ultimately we know that he was tested, not to see if he would sin, not to tempt him to see if he was, was able to sin, no. He was tested to prove Ultimately, what we know, what Kevin was talking about there in Matthew 4, to prove that he cannot sin. He's God. He's absolutely perfect. And we know that Colossians 2, 13 and 14 tells us that he paid for all sin, and you being dead in your sins, dead in your sins, the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened. He, Christ, has made us alive together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, all sins, an infinite God can make an infinite payment for sin at a finite moment in time. He paid for every trespass, every sin that a man has ever committed. Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and he took it out of the way and he nailed it, nailing it to the cross. Paid that payment for sin. Left that crimson stain on that piece of wood, that tree, that Calvary tree climbed the tree of death, and he voluntarily laid his life down for each and every one of us so we ultimately could be born again and forever receive that new nature and ultimately have his righteousness put to our account. It is only belief. It's that simple. I don't know why uh, people want to complicate it. Or, you know, they say it's easy believism. Easy believism. Why don't, I don't want hard believism. I want easy believers. The only reason it's easy because ultimately God did all the work and he's given it to us as a gift and we all we have to do is accept it. Yet man wants to deny that over and over and over. They think they have to earn it. But the Bible is so clear. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, his son. And ultimately, we know that when Mary and Joseph came to Bethlehem, we know the inn was full. It was full. And they had to go to the, you know, a manger, a feed trough he was born in. It went where the animals were, out to the barn. There was no room in the inn for him. And the question is, you know, is there room in your life for Christ? Ultimately, you know, can you understand that you're a sinner and you deserve to go to hell? And ultimately, you need Christ Jesus to save you. And only he can save you from hell if we deserve to heaven we don't. It is only belief. And ultimately, when you do believe, it's half. It's a present tense possession. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me hath everlasting life. You receive eternal life the second you believe. We don't get eternal life when we die. We don't get eternal life a year from now. We get eternal life the second we believe. That's the promise. That's the gift that he's given us. And I can ultimately, I don't stagger at that promise. I actually take him at his word on that. I know where I'm going. And that's what he wants us to do, that we can know where we're going to believe is a promise, because promise, eternal life is a promise, and hope of eternal life, which God, that cannot lie, promised before the world began. We know the gospel is eternal, and the true test to the gospel is, do you know you're going to heaven when you die? Why? Because Christ paid for all of my sins. Yes. Can you say you're not going to hell? Yes. Why? Because Christ paid for all of my sins. I, I, I know I do boast in the cross. I do boast in the finished redemptive work of Christ. It's a promise. I can know I'm not going to hell. I think that's the one most wonderful thing. And to say that, to be able to verbally say, I know I cannot go to hell, is an awesome thing to say. Why? Because of what Calvary did, what Christ did for me. He paid for every one of my sins. Why? So I can know I have eternal life. These things are written on you. Believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know you have eternal life, and that you may believe in the name of the Son of God. Not that you hope so, or maybe. It's a no-so. Absolute assurance. Guarantee. He did all the work. And if you pay for all, every one of your sins, you, know, you can know you're going to heaven. That is the amazing gift in Christ. That's why we do love him. My wife and I, we love him. And we love serving him. And we ultimately we give praise for our eternal security. Praise for ultimately knowing that we're sinners saved by his grace. 
As we continue to go through the prophetic timeline we went through, today we're on the last one. The new heaven, the new earth, and the new Jerusalem. Oh, it is, uh, we come to the end, this will be the last message for the prophetic timeline. It was a, basically a 10-week series, 10-Sunday series on the prophetic timeline. And we come to the Revelations 21, verses 1 and 2. And I saw a new heaven and new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem coming down from God of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. If you open your Bibles over to Revelation chapter 21, you can put your marker there and know that we'll be reading Revelation chapter 20, 21 quite often today. There should be a Bible in front of you. But just the point there, the holy city, Jerusalem coming down, ultimately there, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. It reminds me of John 14, verse 2 and 3. And in my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and I go and prepare a place for you. I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. He's preparing this new Jerusalem for us, the church. And ultimately, he's going to bring it back with him one day. We know he's going to come at the second advent. He'll rule on earth for a thousand years, right here. And ultimately, we know we're at the white throne judgment here. We will not be attending there. We'll ultimately be bystanders. We'll be watching. And then here, the new heaven, the new earth, and the new Jerusalem. And uh, so we'll get through our message today. And this will be the last series on the prophetic timeline. And that prophetic timeline, we know that we live in the dispensation age right here, the church age. We're going to be raptured. We're going to attend to the judgment seat of Christ. This is the day of the Lord, the start of the day of the Lord, seven-year tribulation for the nation of Israel, ultimately where they'll accept the Messiah. They'll look upon the one they pierced, and they'll ultimately receive him as their Savior there. That's the marriage supper of the Lamb. Jesus will rule and reign a thousand years from Jerusalem. He will rule and reign a thousand years from Jerusalem. Then there'll be a great white throne judgment, and then there'll be the new heaven, the new earth, and the new Jerusalem. Let's look at a scripture related to this new heaven, new earth, and new Jerusalem. Maybe it might be new to some of you, maybe some of you have never heard this, but it is at the end of this timeline before we ultimately move on into eternity. And Isaiah it talks about there, Isaiah 65, 7, it says, For behold, I create a new heaven and a new earth, and the former shall not be remembered nor come into mind. Well, think about that. I mean, we're in the, the formal will not be remembered. Ultimately, that kind of makes me think of Revelation 21, 4. The former not be remembered nor come into mind. Isaiah 66, 22 says this. For the new heavens and the new earth, which I will make, shall remain before me, saith the Lord. So shall your seed and your name remain. Hmm. Your name. We're going to talk about your name. Your name is written somewhere. It's written in the books, or it's written in the Lamb's Book of Life, the Book of Life. Your name will remain forever. Hmm. And hopefully today you'll understand where your name is at. The old heaven, the old the earth will pass away, but your seed and name remain. Second Peter talks a little bit about this also. Second Peter chapter 3, we'll look at verse 10 through 11, and then 12 through 13. The day of the Lord, it says right there, will come as a thief in the night. It's right here. We have no idea when the rapture happened, and we have no idea when this is going to happen. For us, the rapture is called the day of Christ, the day of the Lord, or for the people here on earth. It is going to be a judgment time for them. In first, second, or second Peter 3, 10 through 12, it says, But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also, the works that are therein shall be burned up. The works burned up. Seething then that these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness. Verse 12. Looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat, and nevertheless we, according to his promise, look for the new heavens, and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. Think about that. 
It's only going to be righteousness after ultimate living in the new heaven and new earth. And what righteousness is that? We talked a little bit about that already. The works that are there and on the earth shall be burned up, and the new heaven and new earth shall ultimately dwell as righteousness. Revelation 3.12 talks a little bit about it. I missed one. So Revelation 3.12, I don't have it up here. There it is. Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the, in the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out, and I will write upon the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, which is the new Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven. From my God I will write upon him my new name. So we have this new Jerusalem that's going to come down. And we know we have the, ultimately the measurements of that. I think it's Revelation 21. We know it's 1,500 miles by 1,500 miles by 1,500 miles. And it will sit right on the top of the earth one day. Revelations 21, one, verse 1 and 2. We read that already at the beginning of the service. But there's some great information in Isaiah 65, 66, 2 Peter chapter 3, and Revelations 21 related to the new heaven, new earth, and the new Jerusalem. And ultimately, we're going to dissect some of these and ultimately help us understand this prophetic timeline, help us understand what we get to look forward to because we know the Spirit and all prophecy speak of Jesus Christ. And where Jesus Christ is, we will be. And I look forward to spending eternity with my Savior and ultimately in heaven. So ultimately, this fire that we read about in Second Peter there, is it a remodel job? Or is it a total annihilation? The earth. Does he just speak and this earth is gone and then he creates a new earth? Or is it a remodel job? Ultimately, I think we can look through history, and I believe it's a remodeling myself. Because in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 5, it talks about the flood. Just like the you know, antediluvian time, the time before, ultimately, the flood there. In 2 Peter 2, 5, and spared not the old world, but saved Noah and the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness. Love that verse, because Noah was a preacher, you know, and he preached the righteousness of Christ. People in the Old Testament think that people were saved under the law. Well, we know that the Abrahamic covenant, the, ultimately the promise that gave, God gave to Abraham was 430 years before the law came into effect. And ultimately we know that Abraham seen the day of Christ. He saw this in John 8, 56. He looked to the cross and ultimately he rejoiced. He saw the day of Christ there. He rejoiced that ultimately he knew that Jesus Christ died on the cross for his sins. In Galatians 3.8, we know that ultimately God shared the gospel with Abraham himself. But here Noah, before Abraham, was a preacher of righteousness. That is going to be our next series that we go into. It's going to be starting in Genesis. And we're going to go through the Bible and talk about the men and women of the Bible bringing in the flood upon the world of ungodly. So just like the flood, it will be a remodel job. The earth, ultimately the earth and the first heaven will be refined, judged by fire. I said first heaven. I did, because there are three heavens. So this remodel job, this fire will be of just the first heaven. So let's talk about the first, the, the three heavens quickly here so we understand what's going to be firmed, what's going to be judged Ultimately, what's going to be remodeled here? So the Father and the Son dwell in the third heaven. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 2, it says this. I knew a man, Christ, above 14 years ago, whether in the body I cannot tell, or whether out of the body I cannot tell. God knoweth such an one caught up to the third heaven. And we know that if you continue to read in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, we know that paradise is up today. Before the cross of Calvary, we know paradise is down. You can look at that poster back there. We know paradise was in the belly of the earth. Before Christ died on the cross, before he paid for any sin, everybody in the Old Testament went to Abraham's bosom. Paradise was down. We know that ultimately Christ descended first before he ascended. He was three days, three nights in the belly of the earth, as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the well. And we know today when people are absent from the body, they're absent from the body of the present Lord. Par paradise is up today. 
and ultimately people are in heaven today because Christ paid the work. He ultimately went to heaven, he shed his blood, he went into the tabernacle in heaven and sprinkled his blood on the mercy seat of him and it's forever a testimony that he paid the price for us. So ultimately the first heaven, what is the first heaven? In Psalm 19, ultimately he says, the heavens declare his glory. What is that? Well, during the daytime, we see the first heaven. It's our atmosphere. At night, we see the second heaven. It's the universe. The heavens declare his glory. So during the day, we can rejoice and ultimately through our atmosphere here, we can ultimately give rejoice and ultimately through that first heaven and the second heaven in the evening, we re rejoice about that universe that he has displayed for us, ultimately full display his power and his glory. So at the end of the white throne judgment, this time right here. Not for us, if you're saved. If you're lost, if you're trusting in anything other than the finished redemptive work of Christ. If you're trusting in your good works, your deeds, a sacrament, a priest to save you, a church to save you. You're going to miss the mark. And you will be judged at the great white throne judgment. So at the same time as this great white throne judgment is happening, and says in Revelation 20, verse 14 and 15, and the death and hell were cast in the lake of fire. This is the second death. It's a spiritual death. Eternally separated from God. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast in the lake of fire. So God will remodel and re renovate the earth by fire at the same time as the great white throne judgment. There will be a refining, a judgment on this earth by fire. Just like he flooded the earth the first time, second time will be by fire. We know that in 2 Peter chapter 3. The heavens being on fire. New heavens, new earth. The first heaven, atmosphere. Earth on fire, refined, judged by fire. This will happen at the same time. I would hope that you would open up your Bible to Revelation chapter 20, verse 10. I want you to see this. If you can make the connection here in your in you, you can read it for yourself that this thing happens at the same time as the great white throne judgment. If you have a Bible, turn to Revelation chapter 20. Revelation is the last book in the Bible, and you can read it for yourself. We'll start in verse. 10. Look what he says here. And I'll try to pop it up here. But I would like you to see it for yourself in Revelation chapter 20, verse 10. This is the great white throne judgment. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books, according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up death which were in them, and they were judged, every man, according to their works. And death and hell were cast in the lake of fire. This is the second death. Whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Look at 21.1. And I saw a new heaven and new earth. So ultimately, we at that time of the great white throne judgment, we, he ultimately, after that sun, he sees a new heaven, new earth. It happens at the same time, this refining judgment happens on the earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I saw John, and I, John, saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Verse 3. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with them, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. 
And God himself shall be with them and be their God. Amen to that. And God shall wipe away all their tears in their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. Look what he, see, look what he says there in verse 5. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said unto me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. Jesus spoke about this same thing during the Olivet Discourse in Matthew chapter 24, verse 35. It's not 23 there. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. Way. Earth and the atmosphere will, that we're familiar with will be gone. One day there'll be a new heaven and new earth. The new earth will only be inhabited by individuals who have Christ's righteousness put to their account. That righteousness, we know that is at the end of 2 Timothy, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 13, where dwelleth righteousness. That righteousness is only received one way. In Romans chapter 3, verse 23 through 8, gives us the greatest definition of how that righteousness is achieved. It says there in 23, for all sin and come short of the glory of God. But being justified freely, freed from the penalty of sin, justified freely. I don't understand why people can't understand that, because people think they've got to turn from sin, be good, go to church, give money. Now, some of those things are good. We need like a church. We need finances to pay for the lights, and then we support our missions board over here, all these people on this board are people that we support around the world. And ultimately, that's a great thing. But we don't give to go to church, to go to heaven. No. It's called grace giving. We ultimately learn how to sacrifice as Christ sacrificed for us. But justified freely by his grace. None of us deserve it. It's a free gift. Through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Redemption means re a redeeming. A ransom has been paid. We've been kidnapped. You know who kidnapped us? It was sin. And sin requires a death payment. He doesn't want money. He doesn't want your church attendance. He doesn't want you to... He wants a death sentence. And ultimately Christ paid that ransom for each and every one of us. And look what he says here in 25. Whom God had set forth to be propitiation. Another interesting word propitiation ultimately means satisfied sacrifice christ was a satisfied sacrifice for sin through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the forgiveness of sins that are passed through the forbearance of god those are ultimately talking about the past of the people that lived from adam here to the cross he paid for those to declare i say that this time his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. You know what it doesn't say? It doesn't say whoever baptized, whoever is a church attendant, whoever goes to confession. No, it says whoever believes in Jesus. It is that easy. We receive Christ's righteousness the second we come to him by faith. These are the born again believers who have the new resurrected glorified bodies. Ultimately, that we're will never die and never have sin. Did he get it? Easy's taking the attention. Everybody's looking at it. <laughs> But in this new earth, in this remodeling, in this judgment, the earth will be refined by fire. A new earth will be completely free from sin, free from sorrow, and free from death. Think about that. There'll be no sorrow, no death, no sin in this new earth. Revelation 21, 4. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death. Neither sorrow, nor crying. Neither shall be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. What causes death? Sin. Romans 5, 12. What causes sorrow? Sin. If there's no more sin, then there's no more death. And that's a world that we get to look forward to. 
In Revelation 21, 10. Again, if you're in Revelation, we'll be reading quite a bit there. And he carried me away into the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God. I don't know about you, but when I read that, I see a city, a great city, descending, a new Jerusalem descending, sitting on earth, just like that. A new refined earth with a new Jerusalem, and God could do, could do anything. Hard to see this with our fi finite mind, but ultimately it's what God has promised us. In Revelation 21, if you are still in Revelation 21, drop down to verse 23 to 27. Look what it happens in this city. Pretty awesome stuff. And the city had no need for sun, need of the sun. The light of Christ, who is the light, will there be no need for light, sun. Well, you know, today, when you look at your, the all of our lights, a man is all imperfect. Why? Because they cast shadows. That's an imperfect light. But ultimately, we know that in the new Jerusalem there, there'll be no shadows. It'll be a perfect light. Neither of the moon to shine in it, the glory of God to lighten it. Look what it says there. And the Lamb is the light thereof, and the nations of them which are saved shall walk in the light of it, and the kings of the earth to bring the glory and honor into it. And the gates of it shall not be shut all the day, for there shall be no night therein. The New Jerusalem actually has 12 gates. 12 gates, three on each side of the New Jerusalem. Solid pearls. It's a pearl that actually goes into the wall that is made of like jasper, solid gold, I believe it would be, or diamond, solid diamond wall. But these gates don't have a, they don't have a gate on them that closes. They're forever open because it's forever day in heaven. And Peter does not stand there and ultimately look at, you know, all these good works that you did, like some of these, you know, uh, you know false doctrine wanted you to think. It's guaranteed for us, the ones that have trusted in Christ alone. And they shall bring the glory and honor of the nations to know it, and there shall in no wise enter into anything. In it. So 25 and 26 there. Let me read 25. And the gates of it shall be shut, shall not be shut all the day, for there shall be no night therein. They shall bring glory and honor of the nations into it. And then you'll see here, this verse in context is related to the new Jerusalem. And there shall in no wise enter anything that defileth, neither whatsoever worketh abomination or maketh a lie, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. That's us, the ones that have come to Christ by faith. Your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. These are the things that we get to look forward to. Look at 22, 18, Revelations. You're already in 21. Look at 22, 18, 19. Now I want to show you something here. For I testify unto every man that heareth the works of the prophecy of this book. Hear the words of the prophecy of this book. If any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. If any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. We know there's a curse that comes to adding or taking away the things written in this book. Look at the verse before that, verse 17. And the Spirit and the Bride, the church, we know the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit speaks of Christ. The Spirit and the Bride say, Come, let him that heareth come. Let him that is a thirst come. And whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. Who's the water of life? John chapter 4, verse 13 through 14. The woman at the well. 
What does Jesus say to her? Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this, of this water shall thirst again, but whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. In John 6, 35, he says, He is the bread of life and the water of life. And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life, and he that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. Jesus, the Christ, the Son of God, is the bread and the water of life. And he's telling us to come freely and consume him, to gobble him up, to eat him up, to consume him, because once you consume him, once you, and we know that consuming him is simply trusting in what he did for us. And when you eat him and consume him and drink him, you never thirst again. Why? Because you have eternal life. He's paid for every one of your sins. You understand salvation. So ultimately, what is the gospel? This is the gospel here. Moreover, I de brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which you have received. They already believed it. They already received it. Where you stand, by which also you are saved. These Corinthians are already saved. Paul is reminding them how they were saved. If you keep in memory that I preached on you, unless you have believed in vain. Now look at verse 3 and 4. This is the gospel that saves. For I delivered on you, first of all, which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, that he was buried and he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. The Corinthians received Christ as their Savior. They consumed him. They gobbled him up, which was believing that Christ died for their sins, buried for them, and resurrected for them. Now, if people want to add to this, in Revelation 22, 18, there's going to be a curse. If a person wants to add to the finished redemptive work of Christ, there'll be a curse upon him or her, and their names will not be written in the to the Lamb's Book of Life. That's the curse. If a person wants to take away from the finished redemptive work of Christ, there will be a curse upon him or her, and their names will not be written in the Lamb's Book of Life. If you can't simply trust in the finished redemptive work, work of Christ, you're like, well, okay, I'm going to believe and I'm going to get trust in my water baptism. You don't understand. You cannot add to the perfect work of Christ. But if you want to add to that, your names will not be written in the Lamb's Book of Life. So do you think the gospel of Christ is important? I would say it's absolutely the most important thing that we've been given to, and we've been entrusted with our entire life, that we not pervert it. God has entrusted us with his saving message, and we're not to, support, we're not to change it any little bit, even if it's to tinkle the ears of people, to tickle the ears, even if it's to fill the chapel. We're not to mess with it. Because when you start messing with it, people don't get saved. See, people, telling people to turn from sin is a problem. Now, turning from sin is probably a good thing after you're saved, but it does nothing for somebody to be saved. Yet we people hear people all the time tell people, turn from sin. Can't find a heaven track out there that doesn't say, turn from sin. Well, that's at work. Turning from sin will never save anyone, and nowhere does it say that in the Bible. Picking up your cross will never save anyone. There's nowhere that says it in the Bible. Asking Jesus in your heart will never save anybody. It's not in the Bible. Telling people that they must make Jesus the Lord of their life, or he's not Lord at all, will never save anybody. That's a commandment. You're telling people to be more good. Making Jesus Lord of your life will never save anybody. It's not in the Bible. There's no baptism, no confirmation, no confession, no church, no good deed, no pastor, no priest, no religion, no sacrament, no tradition, no work of men that can pay or save, pay for sin or save you. That's why he went to the cross. It is my job, a pastor's job, to be clear on the gospel of Christ. That is our job. Noah was a preacher of righteousness. That is the job of the pastor to keep the gospel of Christ clear so people can understand and make a decision. We will not compromise on it to fill seats. We will not compromise on it to fill the box with money. God has given us a gospel. He's entrusted with us and it's not to be compromised. 
Why? Because people need to know the truth so they can make a decision if they want to be saved or not. See, John 1.29 says this. The next day, John the Baptist, John seeth Jesus coming unto him and says, Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. He removes it as far as the east is from the west. Only the blood of Christ can properly pay and satisfy sin, payment. In 1 John 2.2, 2, and he, Christ, is the propitiation, satisfied sacrifice for our sins, and not for ours only, but also the sins of the whole world. Only the blood of Christ, his death, can be a satisfied sacrifice for the sin of all mankind. Again, we're not to add or take away from the finished redemptive work. We're to keep it clear, because it is by this how we're saved. For by grace are you saved through Faith, not, not of yourself. It is a gift of God, not of works as any man should boast. Grace, you don't deserve it, neither do I. But if you believe what he did for you, he'll give it to you by his grace. So the curse, 22, your name will not be written in the Lamb's Book of Life. If you add or take away from this, and we see everybody doing that all the time. They take away from this. They take the spotlight and move it on to themselves. They want to be a God themselves. Throughout the message, you've heard about the books. The great white throne, you'll see two sets of books. The book of life, and then the books. Your name is written somewhere. Look at what these people are here in Philippians chapter 4. Philippians 4, 3, And I entreat thee also, the true yoke fellow, help those women which labored with me in the gospel. These women ultimately worked with Paul to keep the gospel clear. With Clement also, with other my fellow laborers, whose names are in the book of life. Look at Revelations 3, 5. For the book of life. He that overcometh the same shall be clothed in white raiment, and I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before the Father and before his angels. Eternal security right there. You go online, and I tell you what, John MacArthur, John Piper, they want to speak blasphemy of eternal security, and they think eternal security is a doctrine of the devil. You can't go wrong, but I tell you what, we stand on that foundation here of eternal security, because it is true. Once saved, always saved, because I can only be born again one time. Just as Ezekiel was born, he was born one time. Just as Emma was born, she was born one time. And when he's bad or she's bad, they don't, you know, they don't get reborn again. No, they're forever your child. And it's the same thing as a child of God. I'm born one time into God's family. The one who overcometh, the one who, have, who has the garment of salvation, the robe of righteousness, will never be blotted out of the book of life. I will not blot you out. Who are the ones that overcome? Look at this. The Bible is so amazing, because you don't need me to interpret it. The Bible, when you rightly divide the word of truth, and that's why we're to study the word, like Kevin said, that's why we're to read the word, because the word will interpret itself all the time. You don't need me, to, as some man, to come up here and say, well, in the Hebrew or the Greek, those are good to know, but the Bible will interpret itself all the time. Let the word divide itself. Let the word you know, prove itself. Who are the over ones overcome? Look at 1 John chapter 5, verse 4 and 5. Look what it says here. Whatsoever, for whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. Hmm. That goes all the way back to John 3, 3. Jesus says you must be born again to see the kingdom of God. You must be born again to enter the kingdom of God. How is a man born again? And then he goes on. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believed him should not perish, but have everlasting life. How are you born again? When you believe what Christ did for us at Calvary. For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world, and this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. For by grace are you saved through faith. 
Who is he that overcometh the world? But he that is baptized. No. But he that is a, goes to confession. No. But he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God. That's a pretty awesome verse. Jesus is Yahweh. Yahshua is salvation. He's Jehovah God of the Old Testament. Do you believe he did that for you? Because if you do, your name's written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Your name not written in the Lamb's Book of Life, you will not enter the new heaven, new earth, or the new Jerusalem. Individuals not written in the Lamb's Book of Life are written in the books. And all your works are documented. And then you'll be cast in the lake of fire for all eternity. The way the person gets their name in the book of life is coming to Christ by faith. It is only the saved that will live and reign with Christ forever in the new heaven, the new earth, and the new Jerusalem. The earth will be completely free of sin, sorrow, and death. We look forward to that. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. There shall be no more death, neither sorrow, nor crying. Neither shall any more pain, for the former things are passed away. Do you know you're going to heaven? If you were to answer that, hopefully it would be yes. Why? Christ died for your sins. Do you know you can't go to hell? Hopefully your answer is yes. Why? Christ died for my sins. How many sins did Christ pay for? How many sins did Christ pay for? All. If Christ died for all your sins, how many sins are left to be paid for? None. If there are no more sins to pay for, where will we spend eternity? Heaven. With Christ. Christ did all the work. Christ said it was finished. Christ died for your sins so you don't have to go to hell and pay for it. The reason people are there forever is because they can never make a perfect sacrifice. Christ freely gives you the eternal life the second you come to him by faith. Can you believe that he did that for you? Can you handle that? I can. That is such a good thing. Those are the things that we get to look forward to. The rapture. There will be a group of people that will not experience a physical death. I hope that's us, this group. Wouldn't that be incredible? To tend the judgment seat of Christ. These are things that he's going to do for us, his children. He's going to give us rewards for you being a faithful servant, a faithful, a, an obedient child of God. He's going to, we don't do it for salvation, but once you're born into his family, he gives us rewards for coming to church, supporting a church. Being faithful, sharing the gospel, handing out heaven track, inviting people out. You're going to get a reward. If you've witnessed somebody to Christ, a child, your child, you've witnessed to them, they're forever going to be your crown of rejoicing. That's what's going to happen at the judgment seat of Christ. We're not going to go through this timeline here. It's seven-year tribulation. It's for the nation of Israel. It'll be the worst time here on earth. Matthew 24 tells us he has to keep it short. Because man would actually destroy us. We would destroy everybody here on earth. We're going to attend a marriage feast. Man, I love going to marriages. I did my daughters this summer, and her and Alex. It was such a great time. My wife had a blessed time. I look around, see the people I've married here. We get to attend the marriage feast of the Lamb. Again, that's what he's done for us. We get to come back to here on earth, and we, he'll put his feet here at the Mount of Olives. And he will rule and reign, and we will rule and reign with him for a thousand years. We ultimately then will be bystanders at the great white throne. Again, he'll wipe away our tears because I think it's going to be a sad day. Because somebody's going to come into that line in front of God who has not trusted in Jesus Christ as Savior. Somebody we know. Hope to God it's not our mom. Hope to God it's not our dad. Hope to God it's not our grandpa or grandma. Hope to God it's not our child or grandchild that walks up and God judges them based on their works and they're cast in the lake of fire for eternity. 
There probably will be some sorrow there. That's done. We come here, new heaven, new earth, new Jerusalem, and we roll into eternity with him. Pretty awesome stuff that we believers get to look forward to that God has prepared for us. The application for me this week, if you want a copy, I'll email it to you. I've got a copy of the outline, whatever, we can do that for you. Is there a promise to proclaim? I believe there is. The child of God will not be judged at the great white throne judgment. Thank God for that. Thank God my name is not written in the books, that it's written in the book of life. Is there a truth to proclaim? Yeah. If you come to Christ by faith, your name's written in the book of life. And is there a sin to avoid in our life? I think there is. Not living for the temporal things of this world, but living for the eternal things of God. Sharing the gospel with others. So important. Let me show you something. Again, this is the last message for the prophetic timeline here, but before we close here, I'd like to show you something. If you've not seen this before, let this hand you represent you and I. Let me, let me just, you know, we've got a few minutes here. This is how I got saved. My sister had died in 1978. Went to a Bible camp. Man had used a wallet. And that's how I got saved. I understood because of the wallet gesture. Ultimately made it clear to me. And I was nine years old. I would have been nine that October. But anyways, let this hand here represent you and I. This wallet here represents our sin. See, God loves us. For God so loved the world. You put your name in there. For God so loved Lance. For God so loved Kevin. For God so loved Herman. Put your name in there. For God so loved. But we're all sinners. Sin separates us from God. Isaiah 59 tells us that. It's a barrier. Man will try to tell you you can cover that sin up. But my Bible says without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. Let this hand you represent God from eternity past, Jehovah God, Jesus Christ. Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world, Jesus Christ. Revealed himself in the flesh and he went to the cross and he shed his blood. He took our sins upon him and he died and he rose again the third day. For the wages of sin is death. He paid for every one of our sins, resurrecting, showing us, paid in full. And when we believe that, he gives us his righteousness put to our account. All by his amazing grace. If we could just, everybody close their eyes for a second. If you're sitting here today and you know you're saved, why don't you just thank your Father in heaven for all the good he's ever been to you. Thank you. Thank you for all the things that we get to look forward to. If you're born again, you get a lot of things to look forward to. Our life has just begun. I'm still an infant. And I'm going to live into eternity with him. However, you're sitting here today and you don't know where you're going and you just saw the good news. You just heard what Christ did for you. Maybe you're like, man, that's, that's spot on. I, I get it. I understand that. What's well, what you believe? And maybe you're sitting there and like, well, what, what do I need to believe? Well, you could say something like this. Not what you say, but again, I'm just some thoughts that you could think about. It's what you believe, but you could say something like this. I'm a sinner. I know I deserve to go to hell. I don't want to go to hell when I die. I want to go to heaven. Right now, I will believe that Jesus died on the cross for my sins was buried for me and resurrected for me. I'm trusting in Christ alone to save me to heaven. Save me from a hell I deserve to a heaven I don't. If you believe that, you did that just now, you were born again, born into God's family. And why don't you just tell your father right now, because he is your father now, why don't you just tell him thank you Thank you for the free gift of eternal life because that's what you just received. Let's close. Dear Heavenly Father, Father, we just want to thank you for Christ. We're so grateful for your love and your grace and your mercy. We're so grateful that Christ laid, voluntarily laid his life down for each and every one of us. When he was hanging on the cross, he had me on his mind. And then he died for me, he rose again the third day, freely giving me eternal life. 
We thank you for the free gift of eternal life. And Father, we thank you for this, the faithful congregation that faithfully comes out to support and pray for the ministry. Thank you for the people that come out weekly. And Father, we just pray that you bless this message and we ultimately, you could use it for your glory. And we pray that you bring us all back next week as we continue to give glorify you and magnify you. And we pray all this in Christ's name. Amen. We'll have our last song.